Perfect. All righty. Welcome, everybody. I'm Uniqua, community health educator with SBC. Today, we're going to be discussing faith communities and racism, moving from charity to beloved community. And we have Kathy and Ms. Rhonda. And then if you want more information on them, feel free to look at the Hoover app and you'll have more information. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, we know we have one hour, so we're going to um, aim to get through all of our content. But if you need us to slow down and pause and let something sink in, we can, we can modify and do that too, okay? <laughs> So again, our topic is poverty, racism, and human dignity, moving from actor to accomplice as we work for the beloved uh, community. I'm Rhonda Hill. I'm the founder and director of Race and Faith, an organization that is interfaith. In our uh, work, we make space for faith to be a part of the conversation um, as it pertains to racism. And Kathy? Hi, everybody. Great to be with you today. My name is Kathy Coffey Gunther, and I work as a senior mission and Ignatian leadership specialist at Marquette University. And uh, my contact info is right there. Yeah, so at any time, any point in time, feel free. You can email us, reach out if you need to have further conversation or question. We'd love to engage with you further. And our goal for today. Our goals for today are really to consider the intersections of race, faith, and poverty, both at a personal and also systemic or institutional level as regards to our faith and church communities, to explore personal and cultural foundations that could impact our faith and actions, spe specifically regarding justice, race, and poverty, and to consider action plans um, personally and also um, in terms of work we might want to um, bring to our faith communities and our churches related to impacting on um, racism and poverty work. Yeah, so we have uh, perhaps, oh, I don't know if that's not lofty goals, but you know, you got to go big, right? <laughs> to try to achieve something. Uh, so for our time together, we want to um, consider these guidelines for our conversation today. And the first one is to stay present and engaged, which means just bringing all of who you are into this space today. Um, even if you get through some content and it might be confusing or hard or uncomfortable, that's fine. Just allow yourself to go with it. What I like to um, share, well, in this space today, we have all black women, I'm not, that's not uh, often happens for me, so hey. Um, <laughs> but what I like to, to stress is that this space is a safe space and a brave space. Safe space, particularly for people of color, especially when you're in a mixed group and there are other white people in the space. I don't want you to feel pressured, like you have to answer questions or you have to bear your soul, your deepest pain. Um, so that white people can deepen their understandings about racism. So this is a safe space for you to engage and share as you would like to. The brave space is what I like to stress for uh, those of European descent is saying, allow yourself to really be fully present and be vulnerable. You stretch yourself and you share your story and your engagement and how you think about race. And so that's why that's there. And we wanna encourage you to speak your truth. Um, with that, we encourage you to use I statements. I feel like this, I had this experience, not my auntie Sally from Backwoods, Alabama told me blah, blah, a while ago. What's the echo? Okay, so I'm hearing. The streaming, okay, thank you. So we want you to, um, Again, not hurry the process and help us to not hurry the process for you as well. Just remembering that, be willing to stay with discomfort and the fact that you might not get closure because we only have one hour presentation. So everything might not be summed up perfectly. This is our way of getting conversation started. And just be humble. We don't know everything, right? We come to these kinds of experiences because we know we don't know everything. So we're gonna just submit ourselves to the process, share the wisdom that you have and accept that wisdom for other people. Um, not to be too hard on yourself. Don't be too hard on others. Don't be overcritical. 
of yourself. And finally, I always like to encourage people to be gracious. When we talk about racism, we talk about tough issues like racism and poverty together. And then we put in our faith and our own religious convictions on top of that, it can get tense, right? So we wanna put a whole lot of grace into this conversation, grace for yourself and grace for others. So thank you. Amen, Rhonda, that's a great way to start. Um, and I'm gonna just start with a, a couple of quotes just to kind of put us into the right heart and mind and spirit and also to just kind of notice what we feel in our body as we read these quotes together. Somebody has to stand when others are sitting. Somebody has to speak when others are quiet. And that's from Brian Stevenson. Um, you might know him from Just Mercy book or movie, and he's just a beautiful activist in so many ways. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, the good you do today will often be forgotten by tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough, but give your best anyway. I keep showing up. And then, of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And I think um, when we're thinking about this particular quote, it's that invitation for us to decenter where I am, and particularly I am as a white woman here in the space, to the other and to connection and authentic uh, relationship. We have this on a PDF, and so it's like me, maybe me being a little <laughs> wanted to line up perfectly. <laughs> so we want to just jump in, and for this next section, section, I need you to partner up with a person if you can. So everybody get in two, which I think is enough people in here to do that. One, two, one, two. It looks like it. And if it's not, then Kathy will partner up with somebody. We're gonna have a conversation together. We're gonna have a conversation together. Oh, we're gonna have listening. Listening is the purpose. And so if you're watching this via a Zoom, that's okay. If you don't have a partner. You can still participate and answer the question for yourself. So does everybody have a partner to engage in a listening pair together? Are you, are you participating or? Okay, you, I'll tell you the purpose in a second. Okay. Yep, we have enough people. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in and engage this these series of questions in your partner group. We wanna want you to discuss, what did you learn about human dignity growing up? What belief systems inform your ideas of human dignity? And how have they changed, if they've changed at all from your childhood? So each person will have two minutes to share their answers to this question. At this time, the person who's speaking is sharing their response to this, no feedback from the other person, no questions being asked, just pleasantly listening to the person as they share. And then after that two minutes is up, I'm gonna let you know, I'm gonna give you a warning that time is drawing shorter. Then you're gonna switch and the other person will then speak for two minutes. And that time they're not responding to what you said, not asking you more questions about what you said, but just speaking their own truth as it pertains to this question. So everybody understand? Okay, so now we need to decide who is person A in the group. So if you're A, let me see you raise your hand. You see, okay, B, you're gonna go first. All right. Okay. So again, to people who are joining us via Zoom, 
again, just take that time and answer this question for yourself and thinking about what did you learn about hum human dignity growing up? Okay, people, part B, people B, you could go first starting now. It's okay if you finish early. You can, silence is great. 30 seconds. Ten seconds. You might want to wrap up, make your final sentence, and uh, thank your partner for listening. Okay, that's time. Now we're going to switch. And those of you who are A, you will now speak for two minutes answering this question. What did you learn about human dignity growing up? What belief system informs your ideas of human dignity now? And have they changed from your childhood if they've changed at all? Okay, now you're only answering this question, not responding to what you heard that other people say. You're just sharing and telling your truth and your side of the story now. Your two minutes begins now.
What was it like to be the speaker for two minutes? Yeah. Um, I, I like to talk anyway. So I think for me, just speaking, it wasn't really a challenge. Um, I, I like to be able to have these intimate conversations because it allows me to be able to speak my truth in a, in a more intimate setting and not feel so pressured or feel like um, I have to say this because I'm in this larger group setting. But when it's more so intimate, I, it's easy for me to express my truth. Anybody else on listening or speaking? One nice thing about listening is that you realize you have many times a lot of things in common. And at the same time, you realize that, you know, the, the truth can come out on both sides and people need to do more listening on a larger basis a one-on-one, -on -one you can always, as long as everybody has that one-on-one, -on -one, but in the, lar in the larger groups, it's harder for people to pay attention or to listen because they're still busy with their own uh, way of looking at things. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one reason why I really appreciate this exercise, as you both have pointed out. You get the opportunity just to, to, to speak your truth uninterrupted, um, but you also get to listen to another person's truth and find those commonalities as uh, was shared in the back that you may have never even known about without giving yourself that chance to just listen without thinking about your next response or having the pressure to think you gotta be clever or say something to match what that person just said. So that's why I really appreciate this uh, type of experience because we're again having a subject that really is about human dignity and, and going into racism and poverty. And we need to really be attentive and approach these sensitive sub subjects with the listening ear. And I think it aids in that, the aspects of humility. And so now Kathy will share um, some of her founding principles as well as I could also claim them some of my, for myself as well on what we think about human dignity and what shapes our ideas. We'll start with this slide um, on Amago, Amago Day, which is the image of God. And when we think about the image of God, we could do another whole thing like, what does that mean to each one of us? It might be related to our faith tradition or how we grew up and like where we are today, it might be different. But it's that sense that the image of God, at least in a Christian tradition as we are, and we all got to share a little bit about our different, how we come to this is is different. But in ours, the image of God is, in scripture, um, man and women are created in the image and likeness of God. And so that means every person, every man, woman, child is precious, is a gift, is just inherently worthy of human dignity and respect, is beloved just as they are. They're lived, loved their way into this world. And so Marquette is a Catholic and Jesuit university. And so we rely on the sense that every person is created in God's likeness and image. Every person is sacred. Every person is holy. And in Catholic social teaching, that gives us a framework that's aspirational. It's how we wish and hope and want to be is that if we think about each person foundationally, as being inherently holy, sacred, and worthy of dignity and respect as they are, not having to earn it, not having to be worthy of it, not having to fight for it, but just our beingness makes it so. Um, that the implications of that we can see are very powerful. And that means that every person needs to be treated with love, care, respect, dignity, have options and opportunities. And that there's a sense that every single one of us is graced and blessed with possibilities and potentials. And we get to see even more deeply how some of the systemic issues, the institutional issues, um, the external issues really pull from that foundational reality. In Catholic social teaching, um, the, the human dignity fighting for human rights is the central way in which we try and push up against some of those personal and also institutional or systemic issues 
that take away from each person in their dignity and respect. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize. I'm coming with the mic. Yes, ma'am. There's a statement that you made that you assume that all of us are Christian. No, I said the statement you made Meaning Rhonda and I. Yeah, Rhonda, I think thank you for the clarification. Yeah, we have no expectation that everybody is part of our group here as Christian. But for Rhonda and I and our tradition, um, it's related into a sense of God and the human relationship together. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? She thought when I said we. I meant you and me in terms of coming from a Christian perspective. She thought, she said I was assuming everyone was Christian. And I said, no, no, but that's our framework. Yeah. So um, in our conversation today, we want to first just talk about human dignity, dignity in our own framework for that. So in that, in your peers, you got to talk about how you frame it, how you see it, what's your background with it. We shared ours. And now we want to think about that as we move into this conversation about charity and justice. How does our ideas about human dignity play into um, the roles of ourselves? as we see ourselves as people of charity and or people of justice, does dignity play with that at all? Does your ideas about human dignity engage with that at all? And so this next video we're gonna watch, is just a, a quick review, a chat about charity and dignity. The difference between charity and justice for me is that charity is like it's like it's like bandage right it, it, it's bandage it, it's painkillers and justice is, is the surgery for example last month my two of my wisdom teeth decided to have a conversation on the freeway and one was just on literally on a nerve and jumping up and down and the other one was laughing and i was in so much intense pain and my my dentist gave me some painkillers and some mouthwash and they worked perfectly so I don't feel the pain anymore, but in two weeks I have to have surgery because eventually the pain is gonna come back and I can keep taking the painkillers and keep doing the mouthwash and feel good in, in the moment. But next year, 20 years from now, the wisdom teeth still have to be taken out because I've done nothing to address the root cause, which is that I have too many teeth in my big mouth. And I think that's the same way in terms of thinking about charity and justice, that, that charity is what we do and it feels good and it's important but justice is the hard work of surgery of what it takes to move the country forward. And, and, and then I also think that in terms of my own work that charity is me throwing resources at an issue and making the assumption that the problem is one of resources. If they had more of this, if they have more in that, if I give to them what I have, then that solves the problem. But, but, but justice is really about putting myself, my brain, my resources, my talent, my time, and my body, and on the line in a way until we really get at a solution. And that's not sexy, that's not easy, that's incredibly difficult, but that's the only way we as a society will progress, in my humble opinion. Thanks for your patience. Okay, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So we want to share how we define and 
and talk about charity. And so charity for us is a private individual act that responds to the immediate needs of other people. Again, charity is private individual act that responds to the immediate need of other people. And justice is pu public collective actions, responses to long-term needs of the other people. Justice, public collective actions, response to long-term needs of other people. And there on this, this uh, the slide, um, the sign says, we repeat what we don't repair. I believe, I thought that was important. So we wanna hear from you as to your examples of charity, examples of justice, and then some examples where you've seen charity and justice working well together. Anybody wanna share or have an example off top of charity? Especially if you work for SDC, you got to know a whole lot about charity. <laughs> okay. This, this charity, well, you got to an answer for all three. Um, so the example for charity, I work for SDC and the um, program that I work for is MIR. And what we do is provide funds for people that are in need to pay their rent. So that is a form of charity. And the and I would just say justice would be the fact that the uh, law was passed to provide funding for the fact that people were going to be uh, end up being homeless because of COVID nineteen and not being able to pay their bills. So justice was uh, for you when that starts changing a law right. to make room to make, to make the funding for the charity, and then that they work well together to um, help the community. Okay, any other, uh, okay. I had a lot of charities, but uh, I'm gonna try to put the one that has a, work together with the justice at the same time. Charity is when you give sometimes your time to get together with other people to make changes and to provide information. And uh, then the justice portion is where you, I happen to be on the board of the Voice of the Poor at St. Vincent de Paul Society. So what I, I deal with the housing and my job is to basically find laws that are about to be implemented that will help people in what they call assistance, especially with the so-called pandemic of the assistance for rental paying the, the house. So in that sense, the justice is a public and a private thing as a, because private in the sense that you use your own time that you're, that you're uh, putting together what's necessary to implement the, to get the justice to come through and work. Okay, so you, you see people taking their private time and working towards a collective action to make sure something happens for others. Any other comments or thoughts on, or examples of charity, example of justice, or an example of charity and justice working together? Okay, thank you. Uh, I also work in the mayor department, helping uh, people get funds for uh, the rent for the landlords. And the charity is giving away the free money if they qualify, because everybody don't qualify. So we try to encourage them what they need to have to, 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 to determine the, the qualifications for them. You know, we, we want to give them the funds if they qualify. So that's the charity we're giving away the money. Working with them, working justice, working together is, I'm helping them when they come in the, the facility, they need help with the application. So I'm trying to help them get this money if they qualify. So we help with applications and we could tell them what they need to put on the applications if they don't have it. We'll tell them to go home and, and go get it, come back and, you know, and hope that they are qualified for this funding. So that's the justice we're working with them. So what I, what I hear you saying is more your role as an advocate. Yeah in a space of advocating for people to try to get them resources. Yeah, so we want to give them money. Yeah. So and for me, the real key in looking at um, charity and justice, charity is these short-term things, which you've mentioned a lot of, whether it's giving the rent money, grocery money, or giving somebody a code or whatever, these short-term things that happen to alleviate whatever discomfort they may be feeling in that moment at the time. 
And that justice is this long term. What will be the long term effect of um, what do we what can we do to uh, mediate this issue from ever happening again? So then you get into trying to change laws, if you will, or even some wealth distribution is a little bit of maybe what I plan with what you said a little bit, but it is really thinking about how do we keep people from even having to be homeless. That becomes a part of just how do we get people from even having to think about being evicted and not having jobs, you know that's the justice action. Um, that we sometimes it's hard to move into because those are bigger more complex, but we have to force ourselves to go there. Yes. Example, uh, my art teacher, Barb Bremer, uh, she uh, belongs to a gallery at the third world area, you know, on Buffalo Street. Uh, she uh, get to have conversation with different artists, uh, and then she's going with the artist to uh, have a show uh, case mm -hmm. or show uh, art therapy with a prisoner here in Milwaukee. Yes, a new, um, you know, commitment she, she uh, improved now in Milwaukee. I think so it's a nice action because the prisoners, I think so they haven't had life. We don't know their history. Uh, for me, be a um, um, criminal uh, lawyer, a prison, prison doesn't work for me in my beliefs, um, but uh, they had access to the art. Yeah. So having that art as a relief, a creative space for the yeah. prisoners to be able to display their own art, mm -hmm. acts of charity. Yeah. yeah. And a good part of human dignity. I think art, art helps us to claim our human dignity in, I think, a lot of ways. So as we talk about this, we want to think about what are some barriers to justice? How do we get stuck? What ways do you think we get stuck? You can keep going. Um, we want to just ponder this question. How is racism an affront to human dignity? We'll just ponder that for a, a minute. How is racism an affront to human dignity? This is a rhetorical question. <laughs> so I want you to ponder it, think about it. And as we keep going into the presentation, um, we'll unpack that a little bit more, but we'll give them like this. So racism can keep us stuck with charity as the sole mode of participation with those in poverty. So as we acknowledge the role of systemic racism and our personal racial biases, we can begin to move forward in ways that are more just, allowing for advocacy for real, true change. And I think um, oh, I know you asked the story. So I'll let you tell your story. Too. I think, no, no, no. In uh, a lot of my time, especially working with uh, nonprofit organizations and faith based organizations, we get so stuck on the charity end and aiding people as if they can't help themselves and as if we have all of the answers for the people that we don't um, acknowledge their own sense of agency. And I really think that a lot of times when you see that, it's, it's usually a white leadership at the top of the organizations and mainly a black and brown people working at the front lines to try to distribute or do what we can. But that impacts our ability to move really into the just things that may need to be done. You may see for yourself like, man, we need to do this, this, and that, but I can't get my boss or I can't get this agency to stop doing this one action that you know it's not gonna go anywhere. You can keep getting the same repeat. And so I just want us to think about, again, how is racism playing in a part in that? What role does it have to play in organizations, faith-based institutions, not really moving forward and moving into that justice 
space. Oh, that's an easy question because you see, uh, information is a key to change. And many times people cannot make changes because they don't have the information such as what laws are on the books that right now are hindering the use of people from really making changes and then getting together and forming coalitions to make a change. That's why it's so important to let people know that this is like uh, I've said things to our, our board many times to let them know because everything's done virtually now, uh, to let them know what laws have been passed, not those laws that are being discussed unless it's necessary for people to attend the sessions to support the passing or the rejection of a law. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to be involved with the body to make a change in our, and you see what happens is the, uh, the racist area are the people who don't want to make a change because they profit by it. Mm -hmm. And when you're profiting by something, you don't want to give up your power or your greed for that. And, th and you put all that together. It's no one little thing, excuse me. It's a variety of all those little entities. And the key is to make people aware and let them do what part that they can do to help alleviate the problem. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, sharing that, that withholding information, which is a total power play, withholding information, maybe not making laws really clear, um, recognizing that nonprofits, faith-based organizations, they gain some, some profit from just being in charity mode. So that may be uh, not, keep, not keeping them from moving into more acts of justice. And so we want to go over some terms um, over the next 10 minutes or so to help just make sure we're all on the same page when we're having this conversation. For, so for us, racism is a combination of prejudice, privilege, and power. Um, to exact racism, one must have social power privilege based on one's race, thereby being able to use that social power or privilege to further marginalize an individual or group without that same social privilege and power. This then becomes a system of institutional and systemic oppression. So the main thing I wanna stress here is that when we're talking about racism, we're not just talking about prejudice. It's not me looking at Kathy and saying, I don't like Kathy, me as a black woman, looking at Kathy and just saying, I don't like Kathy because she white. It's, it's not just that, or I don't like um, Kathy because she always wearing black. It's not that. So when people get into, you know, they think about those things like, no, it's about the power. It's about the power that comes with it. Racism is about prejudice and power. So if Kathy, because Kathy is white in this system, because I'm a black woman, I don't have the same power to enforce my prejudices. However, Kathy, as a white woman, she can look at me and say she doesn't like me. She can tell the boss. She can tell the police. She could tell whoever, and my whole life is in danger and in trouble. That's the, how racism works. It's, now she has the power to weaponize her prejudice in a way that I don't have, that the system hasn't yielded to me, okay? And so the next following terms are some terms that I think help us uh, relate to this conversation about uh, being uh, charitable or justice-based organization. And they are terms that feed well into the conversation about racism because we meet a lot of people who are either actors, allies, or accomplices in this. And so an actor is, are those who are not yet committed to anti-racism, but want to be seen as informed. Their actions are performative and don't challenge the status quo of racism. They are complicit in racial structures. You may think of a person that fits this right away, that you know they're performative and they're acting like they're into anti-racism work. Then there's an ally. This is anyone from a dominant or majority group that is working towards ending oppression by supporting and advocating for those in marginalized and oppressed groups. You may have somebody that come to your mind when you hear that word. An accomplice, is willing to take a risk 
An accomplice uses the power and privilege they have to challenge the status quo, endangering their physical and social well-being. Maybe you know somebody like that. Sometimes it's harder to come across accomplices, people who are willing to actually risk their lives and put all that they have on the line so that you can have what's, what will help your human dignity flourish. Um, and so Kathy has a story of how she traveled through those phases of being an actor, ally, and a cop. And I think this is why I feel like this topic of how this um, intersects with, ra with racism, faith, um, and justice, and poverty, it's all together. Um, a lot of churches, uh, the, my family church was on 12th and Wisconsin, Jesu. So it was considered one of the members of the inner city churches. And there were a lot of charity acts that we did and still do. Um, but there was never anyone of color or any diversity that was at the table in terms of these planning. And so it's that sense of what the investment could be. You have all these families that go to the grocery store and then fill boxes to deliver these food, or you have uh, maybe some meal programs or you put together some brown bag. It's all good. It's not bad, but it is performative in the sense that you leave feeling better and the situation is exactly the same. And in fact, we've never even had the conversation about it. Um, I think, and so that was kind of how I was raised is doing a lot of work around the city. Um, and yet then we would go home and we didn't really have any friends from that neighborhood, or we didn't really do any actual faith sharing or talking about um, getting to know the agency and not only that, but the wisdom and the gifts of those communities. And so then I would say later um, in my life, I really wanted to be more of an ally and try to see how, like, what are the issues and, you know, how to get involved, whether it be taking an action or petitioning or, um, or else more frontline um, services. I was a social worker and psychologist in my career. So working in very particular with homeless or whatever. And um, seeing again, there's good work there. However, it wasn't until a white colleague at Marquette called me out um, after I helped to arrange a week long um, set of speakers on, at the university where we were doing black, white and the call of the church, really looking at the call of church to address racism head on and decide, are we called to anti-racism work as a campus um, and as a Catholic church? And in that way, this, this white woman um, who was very deep into doing her own re inner reflection and in the work, she said, I, I feel like there's something in you that you need to go deeper. And to go deeper meant being willing to have the heartbreak, to not be able to like go home and not carry this with me and to, to know that the suffering happens every day, all day for so many um, people goes completely against what we believe about human dignity and respect. It causes harm. It makes people's lives dangerous, as Rhonda was just saying, and to, to understand that how can someone rest when you know that, especially in this city, that's happening constantly, constantly um, going to bed, feeling like there's a mother, you know, four miles from me who is worried about her kid walking outside on the street and I, my kid can ride her bike. Like that's not, that, those are the justice issues. And so going deeper into how can we change um, what our call is, you know, spending, I changed my job so that I could be more available to do this work. I went to the president and fought to get some programming in the university and, and different things like that none of it's important. The most important thing is trying to take steps back and lift other people forward, trying to have more leaders, hiring more faculty of color so that our students of color have, have places that they can go and have that vision like we see you, you fit, you can be who you're called to be, use your gifts and your talents. And so trying to make space for that means, you know, taking like getting rid of some of my power to make other people have that sense of power, plan that that platform. And so for me, that's really what at this moment I feel called to. Um, and, you know, taking risks and asking people if they would come over and, you know, 
like, I want to be your friend, but I know I'm white and you're not. And I know there's this between us, but could we, can we work it out somehow? And um, some of the most rich friendships I've ever had are in from taking those kinds of risks of not knowing if someone would be open to that. And I think that um, from a faith perspective, it's very easy and we see it all the time to write a check or to just like drop off some food in the food pantry. It's not that it's bad. Everybody, all organizations need funds and stuff, but to go and just be with people and to be willing to be vulnerable, to go and pray with people, um, to go and really listen and learn from other people and what their stories are and um, seeing that the roadblocks are set from hundreds of years ago and that um, when you understand that, then it, it is our responsibility and that we have always had a benefit at other people's pain. And once you take that on, then you have to keep um, acting on behalf of writing that situation as much as you can. Yeah, um, so as we think about those three works, uh, actor, ally, accomplice, in the space of um, charity and justice work, just being mindful that um, it's people, especially people who are at the actor phase, um, they are probably some of the people that are at the, the head of the organization, you know, they're the leaders and probably in charge and they probably are there just to get a photo op, you know, um, but we have to, um, try to create space and maybe remind them the importance of human dignity because everybody is not going to be open to hearing about racism or being called out for being racist and not that you shouldn't do that to people you can, but going back to and remind them, how does this aid in the dignity of the people we're serving by doing this? That could be one other way to kind of get at and help them to see, oh, well, what are you, what's really on the line for you in this? What are you, what's at stake for you with this? And if they can't answer that, they don't see themselves as an accomplice. This helps us to better understand like, okay, who, where are we at? Where's this organization at? Oh, yeah, I could believe I totally believe that. Um, if you just think about our city, we have the most nonprofits per capita in the whole state. I mean, the whole country. So we have and so add that to all the nonprofits that we have, all the churches that we have, all the other faith based institutions that we have. And we still have high rates of poverty and violence. So, yeah, it's. To, to your point where you're making systemic change is hard, but that's because we have a lot of actors. We have, we have those who are allies, but they're not willing to become accomplices, meaning they're not willing to put themselves on the line. They're not willing to, like Kathy said, at some point where she had to realize she had to step back, she had to let go of a position. So somebody else who was probably more fitting, not, that, not saying you didn't have skills, but more fitting to be in that position to bring about the real change. That's what we really need. And so that gets us to this, I'm gonna get to you too, to this idea of accountability because we have to hold each other accountable. When we're having these boardroom, if you get to be in the board meetings or at the staff meetings or whatever you may be over in the organization, perhaps you have a role in your own faith institution and you can start posing some of these questions. Again, who is this benefiting? How is this really, you got, how is this benefiting me? Sometimes when we're doing those charitable things, we just want to stay comfortable in, a, in that actor space that say, I did something. Um, so we have to just continue to keep asking those questions and put it out there to people and holding others accountable, but our, ourselves accountable as we engage. And really, again, I'm, I'm not saying charity or justice. I think we need both recognizing though more actions of justice will get us to the collective change
that we all need to see that we can flourish um, and see human dignity reflect what we really think it should, right? And so with that, I want to give you another chance to talk together in a pair. Um, and what's some things you learned or are thinking about today that you may want to incorporate into your own space, into your own works of charity and justice? So um, with your partner, I'll give you two minutes again. This time, if you went uh, first, you will uh, be second. So that means everybody who's an A, who's an A will go first. And just answer like, what did you, just one thing maybe you learned or heard today, or since you've been at this conference, uh, of getting in all this information you've been getting, how will that help you moving forward uh, as, as it relates to charity and justice? Okay, so everybody got their partner. Okay, and I'm gonna give you two minutes again. So I'll, I'll tell you when to start. Okay, all, uh, all right, two minutes starts now. Thirty seconds. Okay, final seconds. Thank your partner for listening. Okay, so now we'll switch and um, person B, you will answer the same question or statement share with your partner. Maybe one or two things you would, will um, do to incorporate what you've learned either here today in our time together or overall uh, at the workshop that will help you uh, move more towards justice in your work. Okay, start now.
30 seconds. Okay, thank your partner for listening. So any final comments or questions in our last one to two minutes? You have something to say. just going to say that I think that when people are put into a position of power, whether it be whether they're black or white, they a lot of times they may initially have good intentions, but they forget the reason why they were even put there. Um, and then I feel like in situations like that, people like that need to be reminded on what was the whole point in them being wanting to be in this role and wanting to help the community and then also not realizing that they may that they are an actor and not doing what they initially intended on doing which was being um an advocate or a, um what is it i'm looking for accomplice that's a good good note that's true i think maybe it's the pressure or the environment and people sometimes don't really realize what is happening at the higher levels until they get there and then that pressure so yeah going back and reminding them is that's a good comment um anybody else with a comment or a question actually actually i was talking with karen about a uh, personal experience at the ucc very horrible histories i don't get to say all completely because are too long but uh, like uh, I saw nobody take it action, you know, nobody like to say nothing. I, I had a role to do something, you know, uh, because I was curious always reading how the constitution works and the system works. I mean, um, I didn't feel it scary. I know it was difficult to do it, but I did it. Mm -hmm. I feel in the, the satisfaction, like, do you see like, yeah, mm -hmm. somebody should to know the truth. Somebody uh, get to know who are doing a bad job because they, by the CEOs, they work for the community. They work with, with the money of the community, you know? No, it's the money or, or their pockets. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, treat to us with respect and dignity. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you really became an advocate. Yeah. yeah. It's not easy. No. Gotta take, take the risk. Gotta take the risk, yeah. <laughs> I come to these functions all the time. It's not so much what I learn is what I like to share. And one, and one thing I always like to share is what I share at uh, every meeting I usually go to is that we should learn to love everybody. We don't hide what they like, like their ways. And we must be honest within ourselves who we really are as an individual. It makes it easier of us that everybody has a power. Every power, but I was just feeling like some bus drivers, they have the power to determine whether they want to let you on the bus or not. So, but don't think that just because you have, that you have to be white to have power. Black, red, yellow, brown, all people as individuals have some form of power when they're in charge of any entity. And they can, and if they don't use it for the good, that's where the problems come in. Right, yeah, that's what, that's what she was saying too, is that sometimes no matter if a white or a black person, they get into that position and, and it's, well, it, we couldn't get too deep into it, but that's the power, that's the whole system of white supremacy anyways, we all, we all, that's the water we all swimming in that got a lot of rules. Um, and then I just want to close it off by saying we all got power. And, but the person that really got the power is this man up here. Cause that's the one that got your expiration date in his hand. And without him, you ain't nothing. He give it, he wake you, when he wake you up in the morning, that's, that's, that's a blessing. So when you, how you treat people from that point on is on you because you treat people nice and, and then you get, you get good behind that. You treat people bad, you, you're going to see a, uh, punishment behind that. 
So that's the way people treat people in life. And that's all I want to say. Thank you all for coming. That's our, that's our time. <laughs>